The Chicago Bulls get an impressive win over the Indiana Pacers, a game in which the Bulls held that team to under 100 points for the first time this NBA that it's been done to that team this NBA season. We're going to talk about that game. We're also going to talk about the Javante Green effect on that game. We're also going to talk about Kobe White's one flaw that could come back to bite the Bulls in the ass as they look to finish this season and look at the momentum the Bulls have heading into the final nine games of the season. All that plus a voicemail right after this. You are now tuned in to Chicago Bulls Central, your number one place for all Chicago Bulls news and content. What's going on, Bulls fans? Welcome to another episode of Chicago Bulls Central, your number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related. I'm the host here, Hayes, but more importantly, you guys can follow the channel at Bulls Central Pod on every social media platform that we happen to be on. With that being said, Let's go ahead and get into this content, man. And so the Bulls, of course, we got to start off with this win, man. The Bulls got a, a big, impressive team win over the uh, Indiana Pacers, man. And it was the activity in this game, right? The Chicago Bulls came out about halfway through the first quarter is really where things started clicking for this team on all cylinders. Um, and then we just were able to get the win. You look at the, the fact that we spread the ball out, right? Over half our total baskets made in last night's game were assisted on. And that's a big thing as far as moving the ball around getting everybody involved in your offense. And as we've seen with this Bulls team before, when everyone gets involved, they're way more engaged both offensively and defensively. Nikola Vucevic had a great first half of this game where he scored 17 points in the first half of the game. I'm sorry, 15 points in the first half of the game, seven for the remainder of the game, but that's kind of because of the defense and the way the Indiana Pacers kind of adjusted things. They didn't want Vooch to continue to kill them. That's what good teams do, even though you know the Pacers aren't a great defensive team by any stretch of the imagination. They did make that adjustment, and then we started seeing other players step up. When you really look at the balance of it, right, it was it was Kobe and, and DeMar in the second half of the game. In the first half, it was really, in a lot of ways, it was Nikola Vucevic and Io DeSumo with Vooch having 15 points in that first half of the game. Uh, Vooch in that time going 7 of 11 from the field. He also had nine rebounds in just the first half. And then you look at Io DeSumo going 4 or 5 um, in that first half with 11 points. Now, DeMar still did have 10 points in the first half, but it was really kind of Io DeSumo and it was Nikola Vucevic as far as in that starting lineup having that that really big impact for the Chicago Bulls. And then you look at the flip side of that in the second half of the game. In the second half, it was really Kobe, and it was DeMar DeRozan. DeMar going 6 of 11 from the field. He had 17 points in the second half of the game. Kobe White going 5 of 10 from the field for 11 points in the second half of that game. And, you know, that's kind of, that's fine. That's a normal team when you're adjusting to what the other team is doing defensively. You're going to have different balances over the course of the game. I actually like the fact that the Bulls pivoted. That two players, and it's not like Io and, and Vooch completely fell off in the second half. You could just tell that the defense was kind of guarding them a little bit differently to keep the ball out of their hands. So it finishes with DeMar DeRozan with 27 points, six rebounds, two assists. You got Nikola Vucevic, the second leading scorer, with 22 points. Uh, he goes 9 of 20 from the field overall, 12 rebounds, two assists, and a block from Vooch. Kobe White goes 8 of 21 from the field, 7 rebounds, 2 assists, 1 steal, 18 points. And then you got Io DeSumo with 17 and Alice Caruso with 12. Also, Andre Drummond uh, contributing 14 uh, points and 11 rebounds in the game. And that's an important thing as well, an aspect of this. When you have, for example, uh, when you have Andre Drummond and Nikola Vucevic both able to get double-doubles in the same game, that, that contributes to that rebounding discrepancy that we saw in this game. The Bulls out-rebounded out the Indiana Pacers 54-40 to 40 in this game, a difference of 14 rebounds. That was huge for this team. And so, you know, that's the way that this team needs to play, man. But the fact is, is that the Bulls really set a tone defensively first. They were engaged. They were making an impact defensively. And it really helped their offense be more efficient. And Billy Donovan talked about it after the game where he said this. That's the highest team, scoring team in the league, obviously. The first time they haven't scored 100 points all season. What stood out to you defensively about your guys' effort tonight? You know, I, I thought that... Um... We really were, I thought, very connected defensively. There was really good communication. Um, I thought we were on point when we needed to switch, and we were on point when we needed to stay in, in coverages and stay with our man. And the only way that happens is through communication. I really thought that the help, the way they helped each other, you know, was was really uh, important. To your point, with them being such a hard team to guard offensively, and the number of points they scored. So. I give our guys a lot of credit. You know, I know it was a tough trip for them coming from where they were coming, and, and that happens during the course of the season. But I still felt like the way they responded coming out of our last game against Washington, you know, um, 
it was good to see them do that. And they did it. I thought they did it as a team and they did it collectively as a group. And it's just that's good overall basketball being engaged so much of defense good team defense comes down to communication that's an important part of that game the deflections that Andre Drummond and and uh and Javante Green helped contribute as well but this was a team that was locked in from the start of this game and they understood what and how they needed to go about their business to try to get a dub last night and they did that but a huge part of what everybody is going to be talking about after this game is Javante Green and the impact that he made for the Chicago Bulls. And before we kind of get into the numbers, let's talk. Let, let, let's hear from Javante Green after what he felt after his first game back in almost a year in the UC where Javante said this. Did you happen to notice the, the crowd reaction when you first checked in? Yeah, of course. You know, I, I had butterflies, you know, uh, just going. And then I just knew I had to just go in there and just do what I can. <laughs> okay, what they came to see and do what I can. What I've been doing. But what did that mean to you to have the crowd kind of recognize what you had brought to this team previously? Uh, I mean, it means a lot, you know, especially coming from um, this city, you know, the city that really gave me opportunity to showcase my talent, like doing the game rather than just, you know, bringing me to the league, you know, and just showing, showing out, like, and I, and I know the type of fans Chicago is and, like, what type of players that they like, you know, so, you know, just going out there and just having that feeling that they, the love that they showed tonight was, was a great film. Javante Green and the impact that he made. I know a lot of times last season we talked about the Pat Bev effect, right? The Javante Green effect, at least in this one game, was huge for the Chicago Bulls. And not just in any type of, of minuscule way. It was major the impact that Javante Green played. Javante Green checked in for 19 minutes and 19 seconds in this game. In that time that Javante was in the game, the Bulls had a plus-minus of plus 26, a net rating of 70, a defensive rating of 89, that's an elite defensive rating. 110 is the average defensive rating. That's what the Bulls had in that. They also had a true shooting percentage of 80.3%, and that's because the defense led to easier buckets on the offensive side of the ball, which was a more efficient brand of offense, and it was huge for the Chicago Bulls in that. We also got uh, 76% of the defensive rebounds at, uh, uh, possible for us with Javante on the court and 17, uh, se yeah, basically 17% of the offensive rebounds as well. The Bulls played excellently well in this game. And at least in this one game, Javante showed why role players can be such an important part of getting it. It's not like Javante had the most amazing stat line out there, right? There's nothing really kind of uh, earth-shattering um, <laughs> earth in that. He went two of three from the field for five points, four rebounds, one assist, and one block. The block was, at, was absolutely uh, crazy as well. But it's just that type of impact that you can have in the play, paying the plas passing lanes, getting involved, getting kind of the crowd and the players kind of engaged in that. We found, I found out last night on the broadcast that the Chicago Bulls are at the bottom of the league of dunks this season, which is crazy, right? But those type of things do help energize the crowd, which then gives the team energy. And the team may have found something, right? We've talked about matchups and Billy Donovan kind of understanding situational awareness. But we talked about the numbers of just Javante when he was on the court with any lineup. Lineups that, that featured Alice Caruso and Javante Green in them had a plus-minus of plus 20, an off, a net rating of 101, a, uh, a defensive rating of 66.7. That's amazing. 53% assist uh, percentage on that as well. That type, defensive rebounding of, of 90%. That, that, there could be something special with that lineup. Am I ready to say for sure right now? No, it's a one-game sample size against, against a team that isn't good defensively in the Indiana Pacers. And for the rest of this 10-day contract, best believe that Javante Green is now going to be in the rotation. And if this continues, yeah, that, that may unfortunately mean that uh, that uh, Batim is not in there in that lineup anymore. Unfortunately, that may be the case when it comes down to that. We'll see. But if it keeps having this type of impact, it's hard to not say you got to play the best lineups for you. And if we want Billy Donovan to have better situational awareness, that may mean we, we may not see some players that we want to see they may just not get that opportunity with Javante Green. Now, what the Bulls are going to have to be forced to do is maybe create a roster spot for Javante Green once this 10 days is over, which may mean cutting a Terry Taylor or something like that. But if Javante's having this type of impact and fitting in on the team, I can't see why the Bulls would, would look at that as necessarily a negative, right? So really good game from the Chicago Bulls. I'm glad they were able to get this win and get this victory because we needed it to help create that separation from the uh, Atlanta Hawks that are nipping at our heels at the 10th seed there, which we'll talk about here more towards the end of the show. But I want to talk about Kobe White, right? And 
I, I get it. He played much better this game. I want to give him credit. This is not just talking about this game because he did play better. The 8 of 21 from the field isn't the best, the, the best efficiency, but he is playing better. But when we look at Kobe White, one of the biggest flaws that Kobe White does still have as a player on the Chicago Bulls team, unfortunately, is his inconsistency. When you look at three games prior to uh, uh, the three prior games since he returned from injury, he went 14 of 44 from the field for 31.8% shooting from the field and 5 of 21 from three-point range. And the thing about this is, is that this is not the, the longest drought that Kobe White's had. Now, yes, this one, you can look at him kind of getting back in rhythm as him getting back in rhythm after injury and things like that. And I'm sure that plays a part into it. He avoided a real, what could have been a really nasty injury. But Kobe White's inconsistency is something that that's there. You know, Billy Donovan even talking about it said this, um, you know, uh, for as great as Kobe White has been this season, he still exper experienced dramatic dry spells. And those, uh, you know, those those spells haven't lasted as long as what they did in prior years to Kobe White, where we saw the 10 games where Kobe White just couldn't get scoring and things like that. When he does start scoring well and he gets going and, and getting in rhythm, it really kind of brings, it, it makes you easily forget about it because his highs have been so much higher than what it's been in prior seasons. And the Bulls need Kobe White. And, and I'm not saying that to crap on Kobe. Um, you know, this may have impacted his his most improved player of the year run, things like that. But what Kobe White has done, man, it's, it's been great, but you need it to be more consistent. Billy Donovan saying this. I think he's had enough games back uh, to get his rhythm. I think he's gotten good looks. He hasn't shot the ball well. I think that will be an area of growth for him moving forward has been where he's uh, gone, like on these unbelievable tears for two, three weeks. And then he's had some time where he hasn't shot the ball well. Where that's been a pretty big, where it's been pretty big swing. So you want a more consistent level of effort from Kobe White because he's needed, and because when Kobe White is on, especially offensively, it 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 is so important to the Bulls' offense overall. Now in Kobe's defense as well, he he contributes more than just offensively. Now, right, he does contribute to defense. He draws fouls. He's turned into a really good passer when teams don't take the ball out of his hands, and he's given that opportunity. He makes really good decisions. He cuts the basket. He gets the ball to the bigs. These are all things that Kobe White has also done consistently this season that you can't deny even when he's on a scoring drought. But the fact is, this team offensively, especially for a team that doesn't shoot the three ball all that well, we need Kobe White's explosion. We need his ability to score and to get hot and to get in that rhythm. He's always going to be streaky to a degree, right? And we've seen that happen with star-level players before. So Kobe, who is not quite ascended to star level yet, is going to have that streakiness as well in his game. But we just need to see... Kobe White, and I've said this before, when your shot's not falling, one of the things that I would love to see Kobe White do consistently when that shot is not falling is him getting um, to the free throw line. And I think with his speed, with the strength that he's added as well, um, and his, and the, the, the way that he crafts himself for getting to the bucket, I do think that that is an aspect of Kobe White's game that we can start seeing added a la kind of, a, of a what a DeMar DeRozan does, right? When DeMar isn't necessarily shooting the best, he's still always a threat to get to the free throw line which then helps get, get points on the board and easy points for the team as well. I would really like to see Kobe White kind of start adapting that, understanding how to draw those fouls, to use his change of pace and his quick nature, that quick first step, to kind of get players in bad positions because one of two things can happen. You're either going to finish around the rim or you can draw a foul, right? So that's really what I think a, a huge aspect of Kobe White's game that we need to look at hope, hoping that is going to improve this offseason, you know, with added work, with working with Peter Patton, that's the really the one biggest flaw in Kobe White's game is the inconsistencies. Not nearly as bad as what has been in what has been in prior years. I want to make sure that I say that not nearly as bad, not even in the same stratosphere as how inconsistent he's been at, at times prior into in his NBA career. But now that you're 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 part of the offense, you're you are a large part of the offense. We need that consistently from Kobe White. And so, yeah, we'll see. And, you know, Kobe's going to work himself out of it. I, I, it's no longer a doubt for me when Kobe does go through droughts if he's going to work out of it. It's just how long until he does, right? But hopefully we can see that to where that gets lessened and lessened for him. And then, like I said before, uh, I said it on last night's live stream, if Kobe White and Io DeSumo can find a way to get to be consistent, right, and, and the roles need to be consistent as well, but to be consistent, that backcourt of the future that we look at and say that they can be, that's legit. We just need them. And we haven't seen a whole hell of a lot of games where they've both been playing extremely well, right? We've had games where they've both been very solid and a game where either one of them's been a very good, you know, solid player where the other one's had a, a crazy shooting night. 
We just need them to be consistent. I think that consistency aspect is one of the biggest flaws right now in Kobe White's game. But, you know, Kobe White has worked and improved so much of his skill. It's going to be hard for me to bet against Kobe White. I think that he's going to work it out. It just comes to win. And we'll see what that comes down to, man. But lastly, I did say the last topic that we have before we get into the mailbag is the Bulls and the, and the run to the plane. The Bulls need to continue to build momentum. They still only have a one-and-a-half game advantage over the Atlanta Hawks right now for that ninth seed. Talked on yesterday's daily episode about, you know, how the, the, the run to the ninth seed, or if they do fall to number 10, can affect their draft rating, things like that. But ultimately, the, if the, the Bulls are trying to host that home game in the play-in tournament, they're going to have to keep, the, fight, keep fighting off uh, the, uh, the Atlanta Hawks. They have a one-and-a-half game advantage. Uh, the Hawks are on a three-game winning streak. The Bulls just won. The Hawks are 5-5 five and five in their last 10. The Bulls are four and six. So, you know, when you look at the upcoming schedule for the Bulls, we got the Brooklyn Nets on Friday. We got the Minnesota Timberwolves Sunday. And then we face the Atlanta Hawks on uh, Monday, which is going to be big for kind of creating that little more separation. If the Bulls can get to can split these next two games, right? Or even go two and oh, if they can get two wins in a row um, against Brooklyn and Minnesota and then win that Atlanta game, that could almost seal the rest of the playing race. After the Bulls and the Hawks, play each other on Monday there's only six games left in the season so you know it's it's enough games left to where it could still be an interesting race I'm not saying that the Bulls can completely shut the door on that but this is a, an important stretch for the Bulls to build that momentum to the play-in and to get to avoid the Atlanta Hawks possibly leapfrogging them so let's hope that the Bulls are really kind of locked in on this for the rest of the season the Bulls do have one of the easier schedules the Atlanta Hawks have the the 10th I believe the 10th hardest schedule remaining in the NBA no, the, sorry the fifth hardest schedule remaining left in the NBA, whereas the Bulls only have the 21st uh, hardest schedule in the NBA. So we they, they got to lock in, man, and the Bulls have to take advantage of this. There's technically no easy games for the Chicago Bulls on the schedule at all because we know how this team can lose to anybody. They can win against anybody just depending on the effort they give on the night. But we got nine games. We're in the final nine games of the season. The Hawks have 10 games left which attributes to that half game. So the Bulls have to lock in and have to understand the seriousness of this moment as they head towards another play-in uh, tournament race for the Chicago Bulls. And let's hope that they can they can come out of this on the other side, play extremely well, take care of business, and then we can get a dub, man. Let's hope that that's the case, man, and hope the Bulls really fare well over these next few games. But all right, guys, with that said, uh, we got a few voicemails in the mailbag <clears throat> that we're not going to be able to get to all of them on Saturday's mailbag day. So I want to play uh, one today. This one is, of course, from Shay. Let's go ahead and play that now. What's up, Ace? This is Shay. Look, man, I hate to say this, but regardless of this season or next season, whether we lose tomorrow, lose that, or lose Vujo, whatever, this team ain't never going to change. You're going to get the same thing year after year, and that's due to one person, due to Billy Donovan. Look, I know a lot of people are going to say, hey, this team doesn't mesh well, blah, 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 whatever, whatever. But let's face it, man. As long as we get Billy Donovan at the helm, I don't see this team getting no better either next year or this year. You know, look, he doesn't know how to make in game adjustments too well. He doesn't want players for the right people to well unless he has a veteran player on his team. His team is little to no good. Look, I'm not I know my opinion may change if we start winning next year, but I mean, dude, I don't see this team getting no better, especially with Billy Donovan at the helm. That's just me. Anyway, tell me what you think. Peace. All right, Billy Donovan. Um, here's the thing: is Billy Donovan something that definitely impacts the Bulls negatively? Absolutely. I think we, we've seen it. Right, the, the lack of situational awareness sometimes for Billy Donovan. Uh, the fact that it seems like he comes in with uh, a set uh, rotation already and doesn't really let the kind of the game at any point in time dictates. It just kind of seems like he just he just throws things at the wall. Like, and like I've always said, Billy Donovan is not a horrible basketball coach. He's not. But that doesn't mean he's good for this team. That's just the realistic part of it. Now, I think that ultimately, yes, the Bulls do have a flawed roster, as you alluded to. But some of the limitations of Billy Donovan, especially when you start getting into playoff or play in hopes, those become more evident when you're coaching is one of the is one of the issues for you that just kind of doesn't balance things, right? And we know Billy Donovan's offense works really good, especially when a point guard's playing at a high level. But I've said this before. Billy can make a system work. But when you need such a specific type of roster for your system to work, you got to question just how how uh, impactful the actual system is. Now we can make you can make almost anything work with the right talent around it. But unfortunately, this Bulls team has locked themselves into Billy Donovan. 
Billy is not going anywhere. His contract extension doesn't even come out. Uh, uh, it doesn't even kick in until next season. This could have been Billy Donovan's final season in his contract, which then you could have looked to extend him based off what we've seen over the last two years. But the Bulls extended him early. And that's just now the bed that they have to lay in, unfortunately. And we'll see what ends up coming of it. But uh, here's the thing. I, I get it that, yes, Billy Donovan is holding this team back in certain aspects. But also, our roster holds us back in certain aspects. So either way, you need to fix the roster. And I think that's the first thing that this Bulls team is going to look to do, improve the roster. Now, once this team does get to a place where they've kind of filled in a lot of the holes on the roster, the limitations that we have, and then that could become more glaring. But I think AK and Eversley are always going to look at it and say, well, we don't have that shot blocker. Oh, we don't have those shooters off the bench that we need. And Billy Donovan is going to keep getting opportunity therein. And I don't disagree with your, your thought process on Billy at all. It's just an unfortunate situation that between this front office and ownership that they've locked themselves into Billy Donovan. We'll see what comes with that in the future. But great voicemail there, Shay. Thank you guys for tuning in. Make sure you're following the show at Bull Central Pod. You can send us any feedback, questions, comments, concerns, bullcentralpod at gmail.com. And then lastly, if you want to leave a text message and our voicemail for the mailbag, the number to do so, 773-270-2799. We are the number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related. Thanks to you guys. And like I liked in every episode on, go Bulls. Love you guys. See red if you can, y'all. Peace. This has been a presentation of the Break Break Media. 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 Media.